all of that. Then, <clears throat> politics. Politics is a science of power. Who has it? Who doesn't? How do you lose it? How do you gain it? What kind of respect do you get? What kind of respect do you lose? How do you conduct yourself? Okay, so this is a science of power and governments. History. So, for example, that proverb that we talked about, the hero is the teller of the tale, which is only one way of understanding history. But, and then multiple goals and common purposes. Some people want to go back to Africa. Some people say, I can't relate to Africa, I was born here. Some people go back and forth. <coughs> I used to have a copy of this video. So right after the rebellion in LA, in 92, Blair Underwood got a team of uh, folks and they made this movie in which he cast himself as the lead role of Christ in L.A. So a dreadlock Christ in L.A. And uh, so what he was talking about, and I, I just want you to know in terms of when I describe myself, <laughs> so when I get in discussions with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and people that come to my door or whatever and people say, well, what's your religion? And I say, well, uh, depends on who you talk to. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I was raised by a black liberation theologist. And the reason I have to say that is because there's liberation theology, which is slightly <coughs> different. But a black liberation theologist starts with the basic premise, Christ is black. And Christianity is an African religion. Period. End of discussion. Now, what, you what my grandfather told me, who was a Baptist preacher, said, so why, does, why do we got a white Jesus in the church? He says, because in 1965, white people would burn the church down if we put a black, historically accurate Jesus. Now, when you have discussions with Christians about, oh, well, it doesn't matter what color he is. Okay, if it don't matter what color he is, why aren't you historically accurate? Because people, blonde hair and blue eyes, are not being born in a country where it's 130 degrees in the shade. 40 days and 40 nights in a desert where it's 130 degrees in the shade without sunscreen. Uh -uh. Nice try. So, part of liberation theology then, basically because what we had to do, because remember, we weren't even allowed to be Christian for the first 80 years of the founding of this country, even if we were Christian. And what version of the Bible would we be allowed to get? King James, King James right? So I have my grandma's King James Version of the Bible, the red letter. So Grandpa told me, here's what we do. We pay attention to the red letter portions of it alone. If Jesus said it, we're down with it. If he did it, we're down with it. Forget Paul. Well, why? Because Paul never knew him and he was a murderer. How many people did Jesus kill? How many armies did Jesus lead? Okay, so how do you have Christian soldiers? Huh. How is that possible? Uh, how many, okay, so how many loaves and fishes and raising people from the dead and all that kind of stuff did Paul do? Okay, hmm. Let's go to the source. <laughs> Stick with the source. And there's a political divide happening here, too. Okay? So, remember, this is happening under slavery. This is the 1830s where the first, this is the first black liberation theology text. You can see where black people are writing on their own about the implications for Christianity and the duty of black Christians to resist slavery. 
And this is why we're doing this. All right? Paul is being used by Massa to say, you need to be good slaves, remain under the whip, take the rape and sexual abuse, take the breaking up of your families, pray to Jesus, and you will get your reward if you are good slaves in the good by and by. Okay? Paul is saying that. No, we ain't doing that. I'm sorry. Jesus wants you to be free. Jesus wants you to be free. Now, I could pick a reading of that. Now, you could see why some people not think that I'm Christian. Jesus wants you to be free. Bye, Massa. Later. Okay? Because the slaves are basically... You know, working in the fields and they're singing. Oh, look at those happy darkies. They're always singing, right? And they're singing, steal away to Jesus, which is a code for the Underground Railroad is coming tonight. We going. Bye, Massa. Jesus wants you to be free. So liberation theology basically starts with the premise, you've got to start with a black Jesus, Red letter Bible if you got it, but what my grandpa added to that is you need to find, first of all, his name wasn't Jesus, so you need to find the name that his mama called him, Yeshua. Hold on. And then you also have to find the word in the language he spoke. Uh, what? I'm 10 when you say, what? What language is that? He didn't know what language that was. But you see, you need to find the original Bible in the language that he spoke. Okay, what's that? Right? I mean, and I'm 10. So he gives this <coughs> instruction to the oldest sons of both his daughters. So me and my cousin Kenny basically came to, we're, uh, we might be classed by scholars as Aramaic primacists. That is, Aramaic, the language, primacists, we go back to the first word in Aramaic. And one of the things you find when you do that is that there are Aramaic-speaking Christians today. And the Aramaic-speaking Christians have never engaged in slavery, never engaged in the Crusades, never engaged in genocide, no war, nothing to this day. The most, the, most, the arguments they get, the most radical action they get into is arguing how to pronounce Aramaic words today. But they have never been engaged with any of the western side of the stuff that is associated with the Romans and the western side of the church. None of it. But how do we hear about them? We don't hear about them. Because we're hearing the tale as told by the Romans. Okay, which focuses on, by the way, the Roman cross, or the Latin cross, the first Christ cross of Christianity, let me switch out my bling here, is an ankh. Don't believe me. That's what the dictionary says. Crux ansata, that is cross with a handle. First cross of Christianity. The ankh actually explicitly means eternal life. KRS-1 once said, yeah, wearing a Latin cross is like wearing an electric chair. Are you focusing on the means of his death or are you focusing on his message? The message is eternal life and liberation. Not death. Go ahead. Isn't, isn't the cross like a symbol of why he did what he did though? Um, again, focusing on, if you want to focus on eternal life, be triumphing over oppression, then an ankh is an explicit symbol of doing that. So if you look at the African forms of Christianity, they don't use the Latin cross. They use either the Ankh 
or in Ethiopia, they use the crossroads. And I can actually show you an Ethiopian cross where you've got that figure in the middle. And it's nothing like the Latin cross. Okay, so when I'm talking about, all right, Christianity is an African religion. The oldest book in the world is the Peshitta, which is the Aramaic form of the Bible, 450 AD. When you ask Christian, okay, what year was the King James Version created? Come on, answer it. No, not the Council of Nicaea, it's way after that. Ah, right. Late 1500, 1600. All right. Peshitta is written in 450, 1600. Uh, why aren't we going to the original oldest form of the Bible in Aramaic? Well, there's a reason why. And you find that out when you basically do a language study and look at Aramaic as opposed to Latin. Yeshua didn't speak Latin. Latin was the language of the people who were militarily occupying Palestine at the time. All right? So, part of liberation theology. So, liberation on earth, not salvation in the afterlife. So, there's a difference. Salvation, are you saved? Uh, no, but I'm free. <laughs> Would you rather be free or safe? So that's the idea. Liberation now, not in the afterlife. Right? Jesus, so this is actually, this makes you, this does definitely puts you at odds with what has been portrayed as mainstream Christianity. So when you have people who are out of the Christian faith acting in a way that's counter to what the government says, they're treated like Jesus was going to get in trouble if when, when I publish this, but I'll just say it now, just to establish the trouble. For a large part, of, for the large part of his ministry, Jesus was treated as a criminal and hunted down by the Romans who killed him and then made a holiday out of his birthday. America did that to Martin Luther King. He's considered a criminal, the most dangerous Negro in America. He was killed by Americans, with complicity of the government. This was decided in a court of law in the 90s, so I'm not making it up, not my opinion, by preponderance of the evidence in a civil suit. And then they make a holiday out of it. Hmm. Okay. So there's parallels. America's like the Romans. In that sense. Some good, there's some bad. Does that uh, the bad people make feel better about themselves? Uh, could be. Could work, it could work a lot of different ways. So we have this dichotomy that we've been dealing with since Reconstruction. Oh, you say we're free, but we're not free. We have to earn rights that should have been ours from the beginning that we used to have. But now we have to fight for them. Why are we having to fight for them? Who benefits from that? So liberation theology starts way back in the, the 1830s as black, free black people writing basically a theology of liberation as opposed to salvation based on a reaction to what was going on in slavery because remember, Christianity as practiced by Americans was whites only. They were saying that segregation of the races was God-inspired. God wants the races to be separate. God ordained that white people are superior and you are supposed to save us. You are supposed to serve us. And they're using the King James Version of the Bible to interpret that. You can't get that interpretation from the Peshitta. Cannot. So there is a piece that happens when you have uh, certain people editing not even from the original language. So the Peshitta is only in Arabic? 
It's in Aramaic. It has been translated into English. Yeah. Now, here, here's the trick with that. Consider the source. So, for example, um, that, and that's why you have to use multiple sources, right? So there's a, a, there was a biblical scholar named George Lamsa who was a native Aramaic speaker who basically did a lot of the early translation work and in order, you can do the work, but finding somebody to publish something that's counter to the King James Version of the Bible is tricky. So you'll find his version of the Peshitta published by Rupert Murdoch's company. You know who that is, right? Owner of Fox News. <laughs> so what kind of version of the Peshitta would the owner of Fox News allow to be published? King James. Uh, it is parallel to the Queen, King James, but there are some interesting differences. And are not just translation errors that he was able to slip in. And you can see them if you want, if you study that. And I can show them to you later, but... Um, okay. So, for example, uh, the last words on the cross, what were they? In Matthew. Yeah? Why well, have you forsaken me? Right? Forgive them, you know, the Lord and help forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Yeah, that wasn't the last words, but it's close to it, right? Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Yeah or it is done, or whatever, okay? In Aramaic, Eli, Eli, that's God, right? Lamana, Shabak, Fani. For this I was kept. Also, this was my destiny. I have a parallel version which has five translations from the Aramaic into English. Four non-Aramaic native speakers say, Father, Father, why, why have you forsaken me? And only Lamsa says, for this I was kept. Guess which one I'm going with. Because think about it. There is no record, at least within the Bible, of him crying out during his tortures or making a sound at all. All right? So if your last words are going to be, you know, if you've endured all that pain without speaking at all, are you going to go out with, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? No. He was a master, a master teacher. He ain't going out like that. For this I was kept. This is my destiny. It is finished. I'm out. Plus, there are other things in there. Right? So, that's more consistent with my belief. Brother got killed by the cops. He ain't going out weak. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a classic story, right? What, were the Ro what color were the Romans? Brother gets killed by the cops. Uh, right. Hey. And triumphs. So, hey. So I'm just saying in terms of looking at from African or black liberation theology, basically looking, the image makes a difference. Okay. This is 18th century, that means 1700s. This means before colonization. <laughs> Ethiopian. This is Christ raising Lazarus. So look at Christ. Afro. Look at Lazarus. Gray Afro.
So the, I, the image of raising the dead. So slavery, is this the tenet of liberation theology? Slavery and oppression was the cross. And we're being crucified on in life. We ain't going to wait till we die to get free of this. We're going to get free now because Jesus wants us to be free. So, Yeshua's people didn't believe in a hell or a devil. Slavery was definitely hell, and the slavers definitely acted like devils. So, the natural condition of human beings is freedom and liberation. You're not alive until you are free. So, people living within oppression, so to be in bondage is to be dead. Jesus, quote-unquote, wants you to be free. Now, by any means necessary. Then you see these images. So this is uh, these are icons. Uh, so Jesus Christ, Liberator. Again, whatsoever you do to the least of these, you've done to me. So, for example, if you. By studying not only the Aramaic, but also um, there's a book called Rabbi Jesus in which he talked about um, the synthesis of um, his particular version of Judaism, which is where Christianity comes out of, was a, synth a synthesis of about 200 different sects uh, that were uh, basically happening at his time, two di 200 different sects of Judaism within his time. So his goal was creating an egalitarian spiritual and religious response to Roman oppression. That's why they were hunting him. And religious corruption, which he called the kingdom of heaven. So basically the established religions, the corporate religions, if you will, basically were paying the Romans to have him killed because of, you know, Especially that incident with, in the temple with overturning the money changers. That pissed off a lot of rich folk. Who is this guy? He's making trouble. Now even Pilate said, wait, what law has he broken? Why do you want him dead? Oh well, I'll take the money anyway. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, right. Heal the sick, feed the hungry, Keep people from stoning other people. That's basically it. That's radical. So render unto Caesar, but don't become like Caesar. Because Caesar is cruel and corrupt. Saint Benedict the Black, another icon. He was a uh, old saint within the Catholic Church. Benedict uh, was a slave. A Berber, I believe, like Saint Augustine. Uh, who, who became free and basically concentrated on feeding the poor, hence the whole loaves thing. You will find uh, icons of the Black Madonna, protectress of the oppressed. The, uh, this is like an icon in uh, Spain. So, going back a couple of years, oh, several years, the first inauguration, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who, who has brought us thus far along the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met Thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget Thee. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to thee, O God, and true to our native land. So, where's this quote from? Lowry is quoting a famous song, also known as the Black National Anthem, or actually the Negro National Anthem, because we were called Negroes then. Lift every voice and sing coming out of liberation theology. He's also quoting an old thing. Uh, there used to be a uh, 
We ask you to help us work for that day when black will not be asked to get him back, when brown can stick around, when yellow will be mellow, when red man can get ahead man, and when white will embrace what's right. So this is a play on this old thing. If uh, you're white, you're all right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get on back. So racial hierarchy. Right. All right, so ethnic notions, last half hour. So see the film by Marlon Riggs, or I'll arrange uh, uh, to show it. But if you can find it online, great. So Marlon Riggs, ethnic notions. So an archetype. Is, a, is defined by Jung as a deep psychological structure. So Jung basically thought that they were symbolic, but that they were shared by everybody and all human beings. But he thought of them as simply symbolic, that all people have these deep archetypes like the hero, the plucky young girl, the you know, brave young boy, the wise old man, the evil, you know, all those different things are archetypes. So he thought them as symbolic, common to all people or particular people, and internal to the culture. So every culture has one, because all human beings have the same basic psychology in his worldview, and they just have variations on that particular thing. But in African and native psychology, archetypes aren't just symbols, they're actually real. They're not symbols of things, they actually are the things. They're real, not just symbols. And they are real and reflective of reality out here and also history, how they play out. So an archetype is internal to the culture. Shall we say that from an anthro point of view? Stereotype is outside of the culture. So as an example, <sighs> Stupid PCs. Okay. The Guinea jungle fowl. I need a Mac up in here. I need my Mac to be working with this machine here. Anyway, the Guinea jungle fowl is where chickens came from. Guinea's in Africa. Let's see if the next one comes. No. <laughs> anyway, watermelon is a vine-like flowering plant originally from southern Africa. Its fruit, which is also called watermelon, is a special kind referred to by botanists as a pippi, a berry, which has a thick rind and fleshy center. Here's the thing. The archetype. We, since we had invented some forms of agriculture, cultivated cows and chickens as well as agriculture for oil, right? We also, if you're going to travel across the deserts of southern Africa up into the north, you're going to need a canteen. Why not have a canteen that grows like a watermelon, okay? So since we've had chickens and watermelon for something like before the pyramids, 20,000 years, that's an archetype. Now, some people take those archetypes and make them into stereotypes. Okay, so a stereotype is an external observation and generalization from outside <coughs> of the culture, often negative, but based on the cognitive structures in the brain. So. Cognitive structure, these come from, in cognitive psychology, stereotypes come from you want to make a quick decision because quick decisions are actually favored for survival. You can't be thinking over much about certain things. So stereotypes are part of the function of cognitive, their cognitive structures that allow you to make snap decisions based on how something looks or appears. Now, 
this is from Western psychology, so they're saying, oh, well, stereotypes are just neutral. Well, yeah, they're not really just neutral. But, yeah, well, again, this is Western psychology, which doesn't believe that racism exists either. So, you know, hmm. Anyway, so the whole, I don't know if these uh, will show up. Yeah, they don't. Because they were so great. So let me describe them to you. And hopefully when I put these up, uh, if you're reading it from a Mac, you'll be able to see. No, okay. All right, you have a General Electric ad from the 40s which shows a black person eating a fried chicken drumstick. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Yo, Y-O apostrophe, your next range should be a General Electric. Then a picture of Obama. Not a black stereotype, but do you eat fried chicken? <laughs> then, a brand of watermelon called Sambo brand, black person eating watermelon. Oh, here's a great one. United States food stamp, let's see, with Obama as a jackass, Obama bucks, $10 Obama bucks with, let's see, Kool-Aid, <laughs> Kentucky fried chicken, wow. ribs, and watermelon. Obama bucks. Yeah. You found all of them, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Because they come up in Wikipedia, you just, you know, write search string and boom, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so stereotypes, archetypes. All right, so the reason I'm putting this up is because, again, Part of the image, you know, so Aunt Jemima, so there was a convention from slavery in which black people could be called aunt or uncle if they were advanced age. Whether, regardless of your actual relationship, which could have been actual relationship, but so happy fine Aunt Jemima pancakes Show sets folks singing. I'm just, I'm putting this out in the culture because it's out there, right? So Gawker, for example. So if you go to our history section of the Aunt Jemima website, there's an Aunt Jemima website. It gives a rather whitewashed rundown of key moments in the company's long life. It was founded in 1889, and 100 years later, the image of Aunt Jemima was updated by removing her headband and giving her pearl earrings and a lace collar. But what about the image of Aunt Jemima, say, six or seven decades ago? Did she still stand for warmth, nourishment, and trust? Well, kind of, but it was more of a nourishment and trust of racism. <coughs> Embrace your past, Quaker Oat Company. We dug through the archives for some classic Aunt Jemima ads from the 1940s, and it's true what they say, happy fine Aunt Jemima pancake show sets folks singing about racism. So that's the path on the left, and that's the upgrade. Without the headband, and with pearls. It gets better. Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben's converted rice, right? So Uncle Ben was a servant, right? Because he's serving you the rice, right? But now he has a website because he's retired from serving rice and he has an office. And the website he actually allows you to do a virtual tour of his corporate office. 
So reason I'm bringing this up is who, who do you think is control, who's creating these images and controlling these images and what is the attempt to either talk about the history or not talk about the history, look at it or not look at it. So he was an African-American Texan rice farmer known far and wide for producing high-quality premium rice. Right there and then, they christened their product Uncle Ben's Converted Brand Rice. Though the original Uncle Ben had since passed away, both men who created this brand wanted to recognize him in the symbol of their quality rice products. Of course, Uncle Ben was not related to either of the white men having dinner in Chicago, and from his dress, you wouldn't think he's a farmer serving rice in his own home. So I have a, uh, I don't know if this is on one of the YouTube links, but I have a television show called Diversa TV. And uh, with someone with the art department, someone actually put up um, basically in a, a department in the college which basically concerns itself with food. They have art exhibits that are about food, right? And they weren't necessarily curated as they are in the art world where you look at um, images. So here's the issue in the art world. The protocol is if you use images that have a history, you have to put a context statement, especially if they're a racist image or a sexist image or whatever. You have to put a context statement because people can interpret the images lots of different ways. Now, the law has spoken on this because people have obviously complained about various other art exhibits, like, for example, uh, Robert, Ma not Robert Maplethorpe, but uh, Serrano's uh, Piss Christ, where the crucifix is upside down in the artist's own urine. And his statement is this. What modern-day Christianity is doing today is pissing on the actual legacy of Christ. That's what he was saying with his art. Not that he's saying you should be pissing on a crucifix. No, you, what you're already doing is pissing on his memory. And that's what my art pieces say. And he put that in a context statement, but you know, people have used that. As, oh, well, my tax dollars paid for this. Well, your tax dollars pay for a lot of stuff. Right? So, uh, Aunt Jemima and uh, the contemporary artist's uh, work which is basically drawing from that image even though it's a duck. So the idea is, if you use an image, you have to put a context statement in. Otherwise, if you say nothing, it's assumed you're seconding the racist intent of the original image. Okay? So at least, I mean, so not my opinion, that's a legal precedent, Supreme Court decision. A little bigger. So, this is uh, basically the watermelon picking any freeze, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, forties, roughly. Oh no, it says 1922. <coughs> Okay, so a culture controls its images of its people, or at least knows about, you know, history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, yeah. So I'm not necessarily picking on this particular artist, but you know, these were on our website, and then I'll, I'll show you what the offending piece of art, which you know, people were tripping about uh, when it was up here a couple of years ago. So I want to call your attention in the lower left-hand corner to picking any figure and this demon next to a pot. So this was hanging up uh, in Building 19.
and the piece is called eat which okay so you have the piccaninny figure with the uh, bones her hair grass skirt stirring a pot with a demon dog there's an airplane in there there's a uh, christian symbology in there there's a few things there's pigs eating ham, so it's cannibalism. I mean, this is saying a lot of different things, and so at first glance, second glance, third glance, can generate a lot of feelings, right? So this is just put up without a context statement. So there are a lot of people who actually want to tear it down, and I said, look, a context statement would be nice. Because, and I actually you know, got into an email discussion, and I actually didn't even enter into the email discussion until like several other people had weighed in first, because you know, if I say something, I get this rep for being a, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so I waited for about you know four or five people who all said, "Look, you need a context statement. You need a context statement." And I basically supplied her with the in, in this email. Look, here's the history of the images that you're using. So all I need is an explanation. This almost writes itself. So if you're saying that as part of American culture, because you know there's an airplane here. If you're saying we consume a lot of really toxic stuff. I'm down with this message. This is cool. However disturbing it is, because at least with a context statement, you're setting yourself apart from the history. Okay, the, yeah, the racism. You know, the piccaninny with the bone in her nose, and yeah, she's usually in cartoons, because I grew up with cartoons like this, right? I grew up Right. Sambo restaurants. There is a Sambo restaurant, right? Still in Oregon. The last one on the planet in Newport. Sambo's. Sambo's is Denny's. What used to be Sambo's is Denny's now. Okay? In, uh, they're from Georgia. Right? So there is one Sambo's left, and uh, basically it's in Newport. Privately owned. Check it out. Anyway, the idea is, okay, if we've got demons, we've got racism, we've got all this stuff, pigs being cannibals, put that in a context statement, we're cool. And I can even defend this. I'm not sure I'd pay $5,000 for it because I tend to pay $5,000 for guitars. <coughs> rather than quilts. It's a great piece of art, and she's an acknowledged master of what she does, which is printing this kind of imagery onto fabric. I mean, it, as a piece of art, this is really well done. Technically. The technique isn't the issue. The issue is the imagery that's basically put up there. You know, and in, to, to the degree in her defense, she actually had a um, piece called Let Them Eat Cake, which basically had, you know, a white housewife serving cake, right? So if, if this is a commentary on, you know, middle class values or something like that, cool, but say that too, unless the point needs to be made more or less explicitly. So, uh, she felt that I attacked her and basically took the piece down. She said what this image was, was gas stations used to give out little dolls for free to kids when she was growing up in the 50s because i okay i'm from la so i remember 76 giving little 76 balls and all that kind of stuff i mean okay gas stations can give out all kinds of stuff so are you saying that a gas station gave you a piccaninny doll and she said we called them huggies uh Okay, are you saying that a gas station gave you a piccaninny doll and you called it a huggy and that's why you incorporate? That's a stretch. 
to some people. I mean, I could believe in the South they might give away Piccaninny dolls, maybe. Not in L.A. I'm just saying, okay? But even so, that is when you were a kid, you're an adult now, you're like my age now, you need to contextualize this statement, because, right? So, black people have done stuff, too. This is a piece called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. So yeah, we're using Aunt Jemima, and she has a broom, and she also has a gun. NRA, take note. <coughs> the mammy is raising the little white kid, which is, you know, what she's the mammy figure. The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. Gun in one hand, broom in the other. Now, if you've seen the movie Bamboozle, it uses a lot of this imagery too. It basically talks a little bit more about the history of Spike Lee film and uh, the Topsy doll from back in the day. So, General Tubman, I have freed a thousand slaves and could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. General Harry Tubman, military commander of the Combahee River Action. So, for example, Nzinga, Nanny, Harriet. So, these are different images. So, you women of the African diaspora, because of their successes, against well, what was referred to as the matrix of domination and its evolution from the 1400s <laughs> into the foundations of America. So Nzinga was a military commander of a co-ed army in what is now Angola. Nanny of the Maroons led and uh, devised tactics against the British. That's why she's on the $500 bill in the Bank of Jamaica. And of course, General Tubman of America. Examples of uh, feminine military leadership. This uh, was an active GIF in a website that's since been taken down, but essentially what this is is um, part of a maroon army, so what you might not be able to see in this particular image is that there is a line of people here that look like bushes and with, with spears. And so the cursor is basically just hiding, hi highlighting that particular one in the foreground. So this is how some of the Maroons of Jamaica actually were able to defeat the British, because the British are marching single file, chasing the decoys, and all of a sudden the jungle comes alive and they're wiped out. So, the matrix of domination. Red pill and blue pill. So, what re Bell Hooks refers to as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Alan Johnson, so Bell Hooks, black feminist art, author, Alan Johnson, white male liberal author, refers to as the matrix of domination, they're talking about the same thing. So when Bell talks about white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, she so is not just white, because white is an artificial category, but those who are honorary whites, that is conforming to the values which benefit quote unquote whiteness. So supreme and superior, one, the doctrine of one race over others, Capitalists, and that is amoral capitalism, that is the values of chattel slavery. There, there are theoretically uh, moral forms of capitalism, but mostly what we're seeing in America is amoral. That is, living systems, people, animal, the lands are resources, not relatives, and resources get used up or used to benefit the few, not benefiting all. So, resources, not relatives. Patriarchy, men are superior, not just men, but those who conform to the values determined as normal to benefit men. 
So, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy presents itself as the natural normal order of things, or if you prefer, the matrix of the, the kinder, gener, kinder, gen, kinder uh, gentler appellation, the matrix of domination is the same thing. So, living systems, people, animals, the land, or resources, property that I, the capitalist, own, not relatives, because I paid for it or invested in it, discovered it, even if it's in your body, you weren't using it. You think I'm making that up? That's a court case. Seriously. If they take a tumor out of your body and they make a billion dollars off of drugs from that tumor, you don't get a dime. You weren't using it. That was a court case. Guy sued. White guy sued. Lost. Court said, oh, well, we pay you money, then everybody who was a research subject has to give money. We can't have that. So my rights supersede all others, including those who have lived for thousands of years before I bought it. Money trumps everything. Even morality. If you have money, you count. If you don't have money, you don't count. Patriarchy, heterosexual men are superior to all others. And even though it's, it's the natural and normal order of things, it's, it's less, essentially less than a thousand years old. So, for example, this statistic. So, the matrix is basically a system of structures. So, women constitute half the world's population, probably more actually than half, perform nearly two-thirds of its work hours, receive one-tenth of the world's income, and own less than one one-hundredth of the world's property. And that's from 1980. So there's a structure that keeps that in place, that inequity in place. And the matrix is part of that. The matrix of domination is part of that. So I know he's going to give me the two-minute sign in his section. So, these conditions are replicated and held in place by matrix of domination, which pre prevents access to the power to become effective. So you may have to generate your own power. So the idea of relating to the constitutional stuff and the stuff that's happening in reconstruction in the black codes that's been transported into the 21st century, except it's not just race as being the discriminator. There are lots of different ones, which we'll discuss on Wednesday. So it gave me a minute. So conscientious is down is a, both a noun and a verb, and we'll talk about that when we get here, Wednesday. Thank you, sir.